All right, well, welcome everybody to this evening's presentation uh, on how to get your best result at the Marmot. Uh, my objective is, is exactly that, is to help you achieve your best possible performance on the day itself. No matter how fit you are, no matter how your how well your training has gone or how poorly it's gone, you can always do do uh, do better or worse on the day itself if you if you follow the the right uh, approach. So that's what we're going to go into. Just in case you need reminding, the marmot is a major physical and mental challenge, including four huge climbs, which add up in total to over sixty five kilometers of climbing, five thousand meters vertical. And uh, and it's a day, in fact, that is significantly longer than a typical Tour de France day in the mountains. Most people will take between eight and 12 hours to finish, and a large number of people will abandon. Um, it's the same every year. So it's a, it's a tough event. There are two essential things to get right for a successful ride. The first is pacing, especially on the climbs, of course, and the second is fueling. But before we get into the details of pacing and fueling, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the taper uh, the last couple of weeks. There are now 15 days left before the marmot. You should continue to train normally until about five or 10 days before the event. Five or 10 days is a wide range because tapering is highly individual and what works for one person may not work for another. So your, your taper should be longer if you are older, less fit, less strong, or if you recover slowly. And your taper should be shorter if you're younger, very fit, very strong, and if you recover quickly. But if you're in any doubt, it's better to back off sooner and be conservative about it. Remember that the goal of the taper is to eliminate fatigue without losing any fitness. But training hard right up to the event is very risky for little payoff. You know, the, it really won't make much difference if you train very hard uh, uh, it, it, you know, even, even the weekend before. So if you're in any doubt, just back off. My general suggestion is to reduce your training volume by at least 50% in the final few days and to limit the intensity but maybe not down to zero. That, that, that again is highly individual and particularly for very strong riders, an aggressive taper can be beneficial. I've personally learned that it doesn't work for me. Uh, so, uh, so I'm better at being uh, fully rested, but then I'm, I'm older than most, I'm now 64 years old. So if you're significantly younger than that, you may be able to have a more aggressive taper and it may be beneficial for you. There's only one way to find out, unfortunately, because um, there's no real science on this that can prove one or the other. Uh, the only way to find out is to try. So if the marmot's really important to you, I would suggest being conservative and, and backing off a good at least five days before the event. Now, the other thing you can do in this, particularly in the final few days, is carb loading. The point of carb loading is to ensure that your glycogen stores are full before the start, in the same way that you'd fill the tank of your car before a long journey. There's no need to be obsessive about this. You know, a few years ago, uh, there were some very obsessive and, and aggressive type plans for carb loading. Uh, forget about those. They've, it's been shown not to be particularly beneficial. Just all you need to do is eat an extra serving of carbs per meal on the Thursday and the Friday before the marmot, and then eat normally on Sunday on Saturday. So it's Thursday and Friday, day, uh, um, D minus three and D minus two that are the important ones. And there you just add quite a lot of extra carbs into your diet. It's a kind of an extra portion per meal. But remember to compensate for all those extra calories by eating less fat on those two days. So cut down on things like butter, oil, cheese, fatty meats, and that sort of stuff. If you're eating a lot of pasta, then go easy on the olive oil and the parmesan. You know, may, maybe you should uh, include some rice or potatoes, for example. So it's, it's a simple thing to do, and it's definitely worth doing. Now, let's look at pacing. Your pacing strategy depends on your objective for the event, 
which could be one of four one of four basic objectives. You could either have the objective of trying to win, and that's only really applicable to ten or fifteen people at the most that have a chance of winning the marmot. Uh, otherwise, you might have an objective of trying to achieve a personal best or do your best possible result on the day. Or you might have an objective to finish, simply to finish before the cutoff to get the finisher's medal. Or quite simply, just to enjoy the ride. And it doesn't really matter what happens. Each of these objectives has a different or requires a different pacing strategy. If you want to win, you've got really no choice. You must ride with the lead group and bide your time to attack, most probably on the final climb to Alpha Duos. Okay, so your pace is imposed by the others. If your goal is a personal best or to do, do the best possible, you must ride as close as possible to your limits without going over them. Gaining two to three minutes on the Glandon, for example, can cost you 10 minutes on the later climbs. So for most people, 70 to 75% of FTP or heart rate max will be the maximum sustainable pace throughout the marmot, corresponding to upper zone two, so your endurance zone. But if you're particularly well-trained and a strong rider, you should be able to push this to 80%, maybe slightly above, which is tempo pace. We'll look at how to determine this for yourself in a few minutes. However, be aware that deciding pace at the outset is inherently limiting and it will, it will result in better results on average, but it's unlikely to produce the outliers, which are much better or much worse results. If your goal is only to finish, you should work backwards from the cutoff time at Bourgdoison and make sure you get there in time. Cutoff time there is six o'clock, uh, 1800 hours. So give yourself a time objective to be at the foot of the telegraph and another on the summit of the Galibier. I suggest the objective on the Galibier should be four o'clock and that gives you a reasonable amount of time to come down the valley and reach uh, Bourgdoison before, the, uh, before the, the limit. Finally, this objective uh, of simply enjoying the ride is rather different to the others because it means different things to different people. To some people, it's important to finish. And if that's it, then of course you need to follow the advice I just gave you to be a finisher. If you don't care whether you finish or not, and your pacing is determined by how much you're enjoying it and perhaps by the people you're riding with. So then ignore the competitors and take advantage of the magnificent scenery and just uh, enjoy yourself. Now let's come back to the case where your goal is a personal best or to do the best you can on the day. So again, here you have to ride as close as possible to your limits without ever going over the limit. So how to know where these limits are? That's what we're going to look at now. Getting your pacing right means constantly asking yourself, can I sustain this effort level for the remaining distance? Or another way of putting the question, am I going a little too fast, about right, or a little too slow? So it's this art of finding your limit, and it's a constant question you need to be asking yourself throughout the day. So you should, although you should be asking yourself these questions really all the time, the answer is going to vary depending on where you are on the course. It's not the same on a, on a climb and on a descent, for example. So let's talk, take a look at four different points where your pacing decisions might, might change and where, where they're important. These are at the start for the first, the first few kilometers, on the climbs, of course, in the valleys, there's one valley which is a false flat climb and the other valley is a false flat descent. And then on the final climb. So we'll look at each of those in turn. First of all, at the start, the race always starts very, very fast. There are 15 kilometers to ride until the start of the Glandon, and it's mostly on the flat. It makes sense, of course, to try to stay, stay with a group that's slightly stronger than you but not to overdo it and burn too many matches. You don't want to be making huge efforts to stay in the wheels, just a, an effort to get in the wheel and then, uh, and then it should be easy to, or relatively easy to stay there. So the best advice is to choose a wheel to follow and try to ride as fast as possible for the least effort. If you lose the first wheel, or if the rider turns out to be too slow, and then jump across to another one. But remember, there's a very long way to go. This is just the first 15 kilometers. So don't get carried away. 
and especially on the short climb to the dam, which comes after uh, after after the first uh, seven or eight kilometers, where every year on that short climb, I see people making ridiculously hard efforts, zone five or even zone six efforts to stay with a group that they're almost certain to lose a few kilometers further on. So it's, it's, a, it's an effort for nothing and they're burning a lot of matches for nothing and they'll regret that later on. Okay, so, so don't fall in that trap. Now on the climbs, the best way to see the climbs is as a series of individual time trials. Ignore everybody else and ride at your own pace, which should be the highest pace which you feel you can sustain to the end. However, you need to be conservative on the glandon because you'll be feeling fresh and strong. So you can be easily tempted to overdo it. Remember, it's usually more effective in a pacing strategy to start slow and finish fast rather than the opposite. OK, so it's it, lots of people start the gland on too fast every year. You also need to think about reducing your pace on the Galibier because of the altitude. You, you, you simply can't ride as hard at the at the same effort level at altitude. So you have to back off a little bit on on the Galibier. <laughs> Now, in the valleys, there are two major valleys, of course, um, which are really transitions between the climbs. The first one is 22 kilometers up the Morien Valley to the Telegraph. And then the second one is 37 kilometers down the Valley d'Oiseau uh, to Borg d'Oiseau, uh, to the start of the final climb to Alpajoise. Your goal on the first, um, in the first valley in the Morien should be to reach the Telegraph with the least energy. So you want to stay in a group and spin. You should be eating and drinking because it's important to uh, recover from the glandon effort uh, and and uh, make sure that you're uh, you're fully um, um, you you've eaten as e eaten and drunk what you need to before you start the telegraph. Uh, and uh, if you do find yourself alone, slow down and wait for the next group to catch you up from behind. Okay, don't don't try to ride on hard alone. Just slow down a bit. I'm not talking about stopping, obviously. Just slow down a little bit to, to, a, to a reasonable endurance pace and another group will soon catch you up and then you can jump on the back. Your goal in the second valley is to reach the final climb rested and refueled. That's the key goal going down the, the Valley d'Oiseau. It's Most of it is a gentle descent uh, on which you need to pedal continuously to maintain a good pace. So it's still important to be in a group, uh, especially because there's often a headwind. But uh, and uh, but um, you know, so so make the effort to get in a group and to stay with the group. But again, uh, it's it's really important to focus on refueling and rehydrating during this long transition, which will take at least an hour, maybe an hour and a quarter or or, or more. Uh, one thing to beware of on that uh, long descent is several dark tunnels, which can can uh, surprise be surprising and can can be a bit dangerous. Um, and there are a couple of unexpected climbs towards the end of the descent that can cause cramps if you take them too hard. So be, be aware of that. Finally, on the climb to Alpha Juez itself, first, it's very important to stop at the feed station at the bottom and make sure you've got enough uh, water or, and, or, and fuel to get to the top, you know, and, uh, energy bars or gels or whatever you need. You'll need at least one full water bottle and more if it's hot. The first three kilometers up the climb to Alpajoz, uh, if you haven't done it before, you should know that they are very hard with long ramps at 11 to 12 percent. And then the corners are flat, which brings the average uh, slope down. But the actual the actual ramps are, are, are steep and tough. So you need to climb this early part at an easy pace and wait for the exit of the first village called Lagarde to increase your tempo. And from that point on, the energy you saved at the cost of a few seconds on the glandon should start to pay back in minutes. If you've managed your effort just right, you'll be able to accelerate progressively, increase your, your, your effort progressively to finish at the highest intensity of the day even, and maybe, uh, maybe overtaking dozens of other riders in the last few kilometers, which feels great, obviously. 
Now, none of what I've said so far tells you exactly how hard to ride in terms of an actual number. I've talked about judging your pace to be as close as possible to your limit uh, for the distance, but this isn't easy to do. Importantly, it's subject to error based on the adrenaline coursing through your blood and the other riders who are overtaking you, you know, encouraging you to ride harder. The thing is, miracles don't happen very often, and it's unlikely you'll be much stronger at the moment than you were in training or at other events. So let's look at how you can use the evidence in your training files to create a pacing plan for yourself. The best evidence comes from your, your power meter, assuming you've got one. If you have one, it, it should be always calibrated. And if the data is accurate, it gives a really good frame of reference. If you don't have a power meter, it's not a disaster. You can use VAM, which is VAM, uh, your vertical speed in elevation meters per hour, which number is reported on, uh, on, on every climbing segment on Strava, for example, so it's easy to find. And VAM, um, the vertical climbing speed, in the absence of, of any significant wind and at speeds uh, below about 15 kilometers per hour, that's extremely closely correlated to power. So it's you can use it uh, more or less synonymous, synonymously with power. You can also use heart rate, of course, but it's less reliable because it's influenced by many other factors. So here's a personal example of how, how I uh, worked out the my target power on the climbs when I was preparing for the Marmot in 2019. This is my power duration chart at the time, showing for how long I can continuously hold any particular level of power. My critical power and 60 minute FTP uh, were both about 275 watts at that time. So in theory, I could have ridden any climb of up to one hour at 275 watts. There are two problems with that, of course. First, the Glandon and the Galibia would take me longer than one hour. And secondly, I certainly wouldn't have been able to repeat four climbs in a row at 275 watts. So I have to determine a percentage of that number of critical power or, or, uh, or FTP to ride at. How do I do this? By looking at the evidence from previous events. So here were some recent events, such as liege baston liege Trois-Cols, which is a sportive in France near Lyon, the uh, Time Megev, another sportive in France in the Alps, and the Grand Beau, also uh, another sportive in the Alps uh, from Le Grand Bonhomme. So uh, you can see they were uh, a little easier than the Marmot, but they provided a, a reasonable reference point for the, the power I had, I was able to maintain on the climbs during those events and the percent of FTP. Now looking at those, and based on that, I decided to target the Marmot in 2019 at 210 watts on the Glandon and the Telegraph, and then at 190 watts or 69%, so 210 watts is 76% of my FTP, 190 watts or 69% on the Galibier, again, because of the altitude, it needs to be lower, and then, and then I hoped I could manage again 76% on Alpha Duez. You should be aware that the higher your watts per kilogram, and mine at the time I think was about uh, 3.7 or thereabouts, the higher your target percent of FTP can be. So uh, if you're above four, you can use probably a, a, a significantly higher percent of FTP because you'll be making the climbs that much faster and therefore you've got less time spent at that higher intensity. But let's see what happened. But just before showing you what happened in 2019, I want to show you what were the consequences of failing to follow the plan in 2017. This is my data from that year. The yellow recording is my power in watts, and you can see the entire marmot on this page. So uh, lap one here, this first part was the uh, uh, the ride out to the foot of the Glandon. One here, this is the Glandon. This is the descent from the Glandon. This is the valley of the Morien, lap two. Uh, lap three, number two there is the Telegraph. Then there's the short descent. The Gland, uh, the Galibier is all, is all of this section. That's the feed station there where I stopped. 
this is the descent from the Galibier, and this is the uh, the final climb to uh, you know all the way down the Valley Dwazel, and then this is the final climb to Alpe d'Huez. So my plan was to ride the Glandon and the Telegraph at eighty percent, um, reduce of seventy five percent on the Galibier due to the altitude, and then finish on Alpe d'Huez at eighty percent again. So that was the plan in twenty seventeen. Here's what actually happened. I did manage an average of 80% on the Glendon, but I made the mistake of riding much too hard for the first half of that climb. I rode at 86%, and that was a, a major pacing error, which forced me to slow down on the second part. And from there on, things only got worse. And by the time I got to Alpe d'Huez, I could only manage 60 uh 60 69 percent of my of my fdp so the lesson from this is stick to the plan and don't start too fast you know there's no doubt i could have done much better if i'd stuck to the plan at that at the beginning then so now looking at 2019 this is this is my power record uh, meter recording from that year um and the plan, uh, as you may recall, was to ride the Glandon Telegraph 76, Galibia 69, and Alpe at um, 76. So a little bit lower than what I'd tried in 2017, so I felt a little bit less, uh, less strong. So what actually happened? This time, my pacing on the Glandon, the Telegraph, and the Galibier were just about perfect. You can see it was almost exactly what I planned. The result was that I arrived in, at Borg d'Oison, around here, feeling very proud of myself, and I was sure that I was on a great day, and I was ready to hit the final climb hard and fast and do a really outstanding ride. Well, unfortunately, I hit it way too hard and way too fast. I tried to ride at an extra 20 watts. I could only hold this for a couple of kilometers, before it all fell off the cliff and I finally had to stop not once but twice, quite a long time. Uh, and I finally crawled to the finish at barely 60% of my FTP uh, for the last half of the climb All this section here. So the lesson from this, once again, stick to the plan. This was, it was stupid of me to, to, to try and do 20 watts higher than the plan at the start up Alpe d'Huez. You need to treat the first three kilometers of Alpe d'Huez with a lot of respect and take it easy. And then if you have anything left, then you can pick up the pace progressively. So I should have added the 20 watts uh, towards the end here if I still had them. Um, but of course, I'll never know because I blew up here. So don't do what I did. Stick to the plan. Conclude To conclude on pacing. Determining your target pacing on the climbs means starting from your own historical evidence, and it's then important to make adjustments up or down on the day uh, based upon your recent training, the quality of your taper, the stre your stress levels in the previous few days, uh, the sleep quality in the previous few days, again, your motivation on the day and your general feel on the day. And finally, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, stick to the plan. It'll uh, give you the best chance of having a decent uh, ride. Let's now look at fueling, nutrition and hydration. Whether you get this right or wrong will have a massive impact on your performance. This is really, really important. It's important to understand that the marmot is going to cost you, in terms of energy expenditure, an extra 5,000 calories over and above the 2,000 or so that you need to, to stay alive. There's, it's at least 5,000 calories. It's a very round number, uh, but um, it's a good starting point. There's no way you can consume this much during the event. A typical bar or gel contains less than 150 calories, so you'd need to consume 33 or more of them uh, to, to reach 5,000. So, I mean, that's just <clears throat> completely impossible during an event uh, like Mama. So, as I already mentioned, whoops, uh, what you need to do is to start with a full tank. So, carb heavy on Thursday and Friday in particular. You eat plenty of carbs the days before, pasta, rice, potatoes, and so on. Eat normally on Saturday. 
limiting fiber perhaps because you don't want too much fiber stuck in your gut and then have a carb heavy breakfast three hours before the start yeah three hours before the start it's probably four o'clock in the morning so but particularly if your digestion is slow it's a good idea to set your alarm clock for 4 a.m eat something easy that so you can digest easily and quickly and then go back to sleep at this point nutrition is more important than sleep and it's been shown that a relatively poor night's sleep the night before an event has little impact on your performance, uh, but poor nutrition has a big impact on your performance. So again, it's more important to eat than it is to sleep. So don't hesitate to wake yourself up in the middle of the night, eat something, and then go back to sleep again. Now, when during the event itself, from the start, you should aim at consuming at least 250 and perhaps if you're able to, as much as 500 calories per hour. That's equivalent to 60 grams of uh, of, of carbohydrate or uh, and up to 120 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Now, you can only do the 120 grams or the 500 calories if you've trained your gut uh, and practiced it during training and other events. There's no way you can go out there and do that without having prepared for it and trained for it. Okay. So the actual amount you can consume depends upon what you're used to doing in training. It's really not, uh, uh, it, it's, it's just not easy to digest and make use of 500 calories an hour. So you, you should aim at a minimum of 250. And what does that mean? It means uh, two items an hour of these. these I've put some, item, uh, some, some items up there which are basic equivalents, more or less. A typical bottle of energy drink has about 120 calories in it. A typical gel has, has around 180 to 120. Um, a, an energy bar can have as much as 200. It's usually 100 to 150. And a banana is, is it depends how big it is, but it's uh, you know, usually between 100 and 150. So that gives you an idea. Uh, if, you eat, uh, bet if you eat at least two of those items or consume at least two of those items per hour, then you should be around the 250 per hour. OK, and that should be the minimum. If you take less than that, hour after hour throughout the marmot, if you take less than that, then you're going to have problems uh, towards the end. You'll be running out of energy. So to recap, the two essential things to get right are pacing and fueling. If you follow the recommendations I've just explained, you should be pretty close. Uh, be aware, however, that the marmot is an extremely challenging event to get right. You can see... Uh, Many people, including myself, you saw my uh, two errors that I've made, but I've made others as well. Uh, we're still trying after five or more attempts to get to to get a perfect ride at the moment. That's what keeps us coming back. It's uh, it's a real challenge. It's fun. If you like more tips for the marmot, check out my presentation on YouTube from last year, which includes uh, five mistakes to avoid and five go faster tips. I didn't think it worth repeating them now because. Uh, you know, they're, they're easily available on YouTube. So you can go uh, you can go and watch that. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe and good luck and see you on the start line. You'll you'll see me there in the Alpine Coast pink jersey. So come and say hello. I'd love to have a chat. So that's it. I'm now open for uh, any questions you may have. So so feel free. Uh, shoot. Go ahead and, and ask me any questions you may have. Hi, this is Joe Castro from <clears throat> from London. It's the first time I'm doing the Marmot. Could you tell us a little bit what's available at the feeding stations there? Uh, obviously, you mentioned a lot of fueling is required, but sure. packing all that stuff with us for the whole ride is going to be very challenging. So I wanted to see what's available normally, whether there are big queues or things we need to be worried about at the feeding stations. Maybe if you could walk through the location of the feeding stations in relation to all of these climbs and how maybe you can leverage them. That'd be great too. Thank you. Sure. Um, I haven't, they haven't published the details yet for this year of the location of the feed stations, but I can tell you where they've always been in the past. Uh, the first one is on top of the first climb. So the Glendon. And um, there's a second one, which is basically water, at the start of the telegraph, if I recall correctly, there's another one on top of the telegraph. There's a big one 
um, not quite at the start of the Galibier, but at the end of the town, at the end of the town of Valois, this, the, the village of Valois, there's a, a big one on the left. There's another one on top of the Galibier. And then there's a, finally, there's another one on the uh, in Bourg-Doison at the start of Alpe d'Huez. And then there's also water stations going up Alpe d'Huez, particularly if it's a very hot day. So there are plenty of feed stations. The challenge, as you as you might have guessed, is that sometimes there can be a big crowd, particularly if you're uh, if you're in the middle or towards the back of the uh, of the pack. There can be a lot of people you know, around the feed station, so you can it can take quite a lot of time. But you know you may not have any choice. Um, if all you need is water, by the way, it's worth um, filling up with water at a uh, at a water fountain. If there there are several on the route, um, you can. Uh, there's, there's a website uh, uh, in France um, for water stations for cyclists that you can look at so you have an idea where they are. Uh, but for example, there is uh, there, there are there are water stations at the bottom of the Glandon, and so going down there, which is untimed, you can stop and spend all the time you want to uh, uh, to fill your water bottle. Now, what what will you find on the feed stations? Um, basically, uh, well, the, the the commercial products available. Are from power bar, so there are power bar, um, uh, you know, energy bars and power power gels, and the the uh, the power bar uh, energy drink. I, I forget what it's called. Um, so, I recommend you if you've never used those products before. I recommend you you rush out and buy some quickly this week, um, and test them over the weekend and over the coming week to make sure that you 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 tolerate them well. And then on on every feed station, there's also a variety of fresh food, um, which uh, uh, it, it varies a little bit, but there'll be some fresh fruit. There, there are all, nearly always bananas. Uh, there's usually something salty. There may be salty biscuits. Uh, there may be some uh, cheese or or, 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 um, or or local mountain uh, saucisson, you know, uh, dried sausage, dried meats. Um, there may be peanuts. There may be crisps. Uh, it's uh, I can't I can't tell you exactly what they'll be, but there, there will definitely be enough um, to, 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 you know, there's no risk of it running out, um, but there is a risk of there being a lot of people, as I said before. So I, I hope that answered the question. You did. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Any other questions? Marvin, it's Paul Hudspeth. Thanks for the presentation. Really, really helpful. Um, what if you have any sort of mechanical failures, uh, punches, things like that? Um, things that you, what if you something you can't repair yourself at the side of the road? A puncher, obviously, fingers crossed, do your best with. But but what what's available? Um, not much, to be honest, Paul. Um, there are, of course, um, safety staff, and there are there are motorcycle motorcycles who who are riding up and down. Um, they will, if they can, if they're not, they they will they'll give you a hand if possible. Um, but if you have a, a catastrophic mechanical failure, if you know, if you break your derailleur or something, um, you're on your own until the, the the broom wagon comes and sweeps you up, or or, or until you decide to take a taxi or or, or whatever whatever. Um, th th there's no you know there isn't a sort of a Mavic. Uh, a car with mechanics in it that's available on the course to um, to to fix problems. So you want to be as self-sufficient as possible. I, I always recommend having a minimum of two, um, uh, uh, what, what do you call them, um, inner tubes, um, or, or uh, whatever you need to repair. A, if if you're running tubeless tires, you should have some some plugs uh, and and plenty of gas canisters in case you have a you, you you have a puncture on a tubeless, um, and and just generally be as self sufficient as possible. You know, have a have a tool, have a have a, a multi tool with you, uh, so that if it is repairable with the aid of a tool, at least you can do it quickly by yourself. Thank you. One other thing I haven't talked about at all today, um, but it's um, you can I, I talked more about it last year, is the need to um, make sure that you have the the right a clothing for whatever weather conditions might might happen um especially what that you know it means obviously not having too much uh but on the other hand not lacking something if there's the 
if there's a risk of rain on the Galibier, for example, you need a decent jacket uh, because it can, the temperature can drop. You know, it's it's over 2,700 meters. The temperature can uh, can drop very, very far and fast, and you can find yourself uh, descending. If you find yourself descending in freezing rain, and all you've got on is a is shorts and a cycling jersey, uh, that can be you know a really serious problem. So do do look very carefully at the weather, including on top of the Glandon and the Galibier, uh, to make sure you've got uh, with you what you might need. It remains for me to thank you again for joining me this evening. I wish you a very good luck for your final uh, 15 days or so of preparation. And uh, perhaps see you on the start line. Be a pleasure. Thank you. It's been excellent. Cheers. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye now.